welcome to 21 This Week. I'm Susan Heltimus filling in for Casey Aiken. Coming up next, MCPS calendar angst, new Airbnb guidelines in Montgomery County, and Trump effect on the Maryland gubernatorial race. We are joined today by a panel who will share their unique perspectives. Retired Democratic businessman now specializing in golf and travel, Sam Statland. Mark Unkefer, Secretary of the Maryland Republican Central Committee, former member of the Maryland Board of Education, Lori Halverson, and former Mayor of Rockville, Susan Hoffman. Stay tuned for these topics and more. Welcome back. In 2016, Governor Larry Hogan signed an executive order mandating the starting date of all Maryland public schools be after Labor Day. And the end of the school year cannot be any later than June 15th. All of this to extend family vacations at Ocean City. Waivers from the state school board were offered but were denied to Montgomery and Prince George's County last year. MCPS is now grappling with next year's schedule with multiple options that cut teacher planning days, spring break, and even Jewish holidays on the calendar for 40 years may be gone. And Islamic and Hindu holidays are likely not an option. 180 or 182 school day is also being discussed. And Lord help us all if we have snow days. Lori. MCPS is going to ask for a waiver again this year and requested that the governor push back the end of the school year to June 22nd. You were on the State Board of Education, and I'm wondering, why aren't school systems getting waivers, and is this going to change this year? Well, you know, it's very difficult for the State Board to uh, approve the waivers. There aren't there that many reasons you can approve a wa waiver because Governor Hogan gave them a list of reasons. And one of them is if a, a district has a lot of snow days. Another one is if you have at-risk school or um, a low-risk um, uh, school that where um, kids are uh, like the lowest performing schools where they want to have an innovative school schedule. Uh, the other reason would be if you're a charter school. And um, it's only 10 schools were approved last year that were charter schools or low-risk schools. Uh, and then there were only two schools that were waived because of their snow days. Um, Allegheny and, um, oh, and Garrett County were both um, approved for waivers. Now, there is a loophole that may have been discovered. Um, the state board meeting in July said that, that the at-risk definition is not defined as uh, by law under the state of Maryland. So, so Montgomery County could have a lot of high risk. There could be if, they, if there's, a, if there's a, some kind of a definition that's broadened to include more schools, then it's possible that there could be more schools approved. Now, Mark, education's also been a local issue, but Hogan inserted himself this week and criticized MCPS regarding open schools on Jewish holidays, saying MCPS can do better, calling it dishonest for the county to blame their woes on him. Why is he so adamant about playing a role in an issue that's a local issue, or is he playing to a base because of anti-teacher union sentiments? Uh, Susan, Laurie just explained that the, the calendar is set by state law, so describing now it... Now it is. Well, no, it was by state law, and it the set was set to end at, start after Labor Day. But this was not a partisan issue. This was something that was overwhelmingly supported across the state. It enjoyed the support of Peter Francho when it was initially proposed. Well, this was no, but well, well, let me just finish. Let me finish. Ago. Let me finish. It was Francho. Francho was there at the announcement. When there was an opportunity to bring this up at the legislature, frankly, nobody bothered to do it this year because it was very popular. And it's not a partisan issue. It's something that families like. Besides that, in Montgomery County, there are 144,000 students. Of the 104, and there's an additional 34,000 in private school. Of the 34,000 in private school, half of them are either Jewish or Catholic. So, so what I, my proposal is, is you abolish all religious holidays, period. That gives you plenty of time to play, yada, de yada. And in the county, you know, we only have, uh, the average is four days of missed school. So if you abol abolished all religious holidays, separation of church and state, oh, there we are. then and you then can you resolve the And then you've got the final issue. word, and I can tell you, if people don't get their days off at Christmas and New Year's, there'll be some problems. Okay, now this week the County Council passed two measures to regulate the emerging 
home rental industry, commonly referred to as Airbnb. The measure includes licensure, limits on rental dates and size. The impetus of the legislation is to ensure that all such rentals have a home that's inhabited by an owner. Susan, as a former municipal official, is this good for neighborhoods to ensure that people don't turn rental properties into many hotels? Yes, yes, it's absolutely very good. Um, there's never a campaign um, at the local level that doesn't speak to protecting neighborhoods. So yes, this is a very important um, effort to keep neighborhoods as neighborhoods. If somebody wants to use their home as an Airbnb, fine, but let's not turn it into a rental property when it's a residential area. Yeah. Okay. Well, Sam, is this legislation appropriate in today's global economy, or is it merely another form of government interference on the rights of property owners? I agree with Susan that you're really protecting property within the county and neighborhoods. However, the biggest loophole that I see in this, not necessarily a loophole, but an omission, especially in Montgomery County, is we have a lot of people in foreign service, and we have a lot of people that work overseas for corporations. And these are people who may rent their house out for a year or two or three <laughs> and get reciprocation from people living overseas. Right, but that's so not that, an Airbnb. You're treating this, that's a rental property. But you're yeah. treating well, this. But, you can, but rentals are rental. I mean, you're treating this as an issue between the owners and the, the neighborhood. What about the consumer interest? Uh, I'm, I use Airbnb. It's a good system. It works well. I think that if the, if the lodging industry had stepped up to the plate and addressed the concerns and were more effective in competition, Airbnb would not be available, but they didn't provide well, a limited I, service value. So I think we ought to take more into account by looking at what consumers want to do when consumers like the service. But what the problem is, it's from my understanding, is that you come along and buy six houses and they're spread out throughout nice parts of Montgomery County and you have Airbnb coming and going every right. day of the week. And that's really has an effect on the neighborhood, whether it's security, safety, the property values of the houses around. And, and if you do have an Airbnb, you have to tell your neighbors, listen, I'm filing right. this application. And, and just to follow on, um, this is not necessarily about the consumer, although we do care about the consumer. But ultimately, this is about the character of a neighborhood. We are not necessarily um, required as, as residents of a community to, to be concerned about the consumer. but. The protection of the neighborhood, the character of the neighborhood. People move into a neighborhood not expecting to have, you know, hot and cold running. Um, except rent much renters. of this, except much of this was driven by the hotel industry no, not that wanted to to stop the competition. And I, I beg really your pardon. Do not accept. This is about well, what do you think? We have twenty seconds. Well, I just disagree. I don't think there's any distinction between renting your home for a year or two years. As, or running it on a short-term basis. No, there is. Oh, no. I, I, there is a big difference because you know who's I, coming and going further. In the law that they passed, I didn't see it. I strongly disagree in terms of the um, I un permanence. I understand what you're saying about permanence. If somebody's there for a year or more. You know it. They have. Right. And that note's where it. Yeah. I know this, but we're probably going to talk about this again. Okay. okay. The Boy Scouts of America on Wednesday unanimously approved a plan to open Cub Scouts to girls next year and will phase in allowing Girl Scouts to be Eagle Scouts. Sam, you were a Boy Scout and a Boy Scout leader. Your son is an Eagle. Is this good for boys in scouting to be a part of a co-ed organization? Well, historically, we've, we've had explorer troops, and explorer troops were always a mix between um, ladies and gentlemen. And we had them at NIH, and we had them at, uh, at NASA and But just and a talk few about others. Boy Scouts. So, well, that is, that's a combination between Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. It's not really that new. However, from my point of view, I think it's really beneficial. It benefits the guys because it will help them with their socializations. But you also have to keep in mind that it, the importance I think it is to the girls because I wish that my daughter had been an Eagle Scout because I think really and truly it helps get to college and it helps with a lot of stuff and I think being an Eagle is a really great thing and I'd like the ladies to share in it. Okay, Lori, now your sons or your two sons are Eagle Scouts. <coughs> should the Boy Scouts remain an organization for just boys or should the Girl Scouts have something equivalent to an Eagle designation? You know, I thought it, I was surprised it was a unanimous decision by the board, and I 
um, you know, they've been around for a, over a hundred years and they know boys. The Boy Scouts know how to teach to boys and they have a wonderful curriculum that is catered to boys. I don't know what will happen if they c put the curriculum in with girls. I mean, boys don't do as well in school, but this program is another outlet where they can learn so much um, and my boys have really benefited from it, from it so I would hate to see, I, I just disagree. I feel like it would be watering down a program for boys versus the Girl Scouts, which have a similar program. They have a um, gold award, which is supposed to be equivalent to the Eagle Scout Award, uh, and, 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 and it would water down the boys, and, and for the girls, it would, it would hurt the Girl Scouts, I'm, I'm afraid. Well, that's Laurie, what the Girl couple, Scouts are already here. talking about that, yes. like, what are you yeah. doing Listen, to Girl Scouts? A couple Scouts? of points. First of all, each troop has the option of either having a separate um, group for girls and boys or coming with them. That's number one. Number two, in all of my travels and all the people that I've talked to, from college administrators to executives, I have never heard anybody ever say, I'm hiring that girl because she's a gold or golden. Okay. But Mark, I am hiring think? that kid or letting him eagle. into school because he's Absolutely. an Eagle Scout. What do you think, yeah. Mark? Were you it's a not Boy fair, Scout? It's not I was not a Boy Scout. So. What do you think? Should boys and girls be together? I, well, it's easy to say that you can always have the girls separate than the boys, but if you have a troop with the girls and the boys, how do you keep them separate? When they go camping, it's camping, hard enough to camping get Camping trips are going to be fun, to, and that's it for this. We'll be right go. back after a short break. Yeah. Trump continues to make news. He totally lacked empathy when he went to Puerto Rico to view the hurricane dis dis devastation while making a game of throwing paper towels at victims. He appears to be ignorant of the fact that Puerto Rico is a part of the United States and seems reluctant to help despite the fact Puerto Ricans fight for the U.S. and the military and pay U.S. taxes. FEMA efforts in Puerto Rico have been rated poor at best, and unofficial accounts assert that more than 500 people have died as a result of the hurricane. The largest mass shooting in U.S. history elicits no efforts on behalf of Trump regarding gun measures. He's cutting the American CARE Act via ex executive orders and cutting funds for advertising enrollment while closing down computers that handle ACA registration. 75,000 Marylanders at least will lose coverage thanks to his efforts. The president does not appear to understand that the oath he took regarding preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution means protecting the First Amendment, and that includes the right to kneel during a national anthem, and it also means that the media can cover issues that may be unflattering to the president. How is he doing in light of the fact that someone just recently... Explained. I was waiting for a question there, <laughs> okay. Susan. Obviously, a lot of information in obviously there. <laughs> it was a lot of information, and I won't try and address all of those issues. Here's the thing. A year ago, there was an election, and Trump was elected president. Didn't many get of, the no, most votes, Many though. of the changes, I, uh, but, but, but many of the changes that you described, whether it's Second Amendment or... First uh, Amendment. First Amendment. No, you mentioned Second no, Amendment. No, First no, Amendment. Let me finish, First. please. Second Amendment issues, because you talked about gun issues, but also the ACA issues, he promised that's what he was going to do. There's an opportunity for, the, the, was because the Obama administration attempted to spend money without getting an appropriation, they're now in a position to reverse that by getting an executive order. If Chris Van Hollen wants to operate in a bipartisan basis, he can step up to the plate and compromise with the president and work out is something that is more lasting. The same thing happens with DACA. If you want compromise, you need to come to the table and work with the president rather than launch these over-the-top, shrill, partisan invective Mark, over and over again. Mark, it, it, it's, I think, up to the president to reach out, as he did. Oh, he said, but he has, he has said, no, but wait, wait, wait he did say, he did say on, on this issue come to the table and work out on, on funding the for the... The problem, I think, that I tried to convey in what I said, though, was that he has said he hates everybody in the White House, 
and his behavior is getting more and more erratic. And there are those around him, including Kelly Bannon, who have explained the 25th Amendment to him and how he could be removed. There is real concern, Mark, and it is not political, uh, political, you know, obnoxiousness to say that there are real concerns about his stability. And his decisions, maybe he said he wanted to get rid of the Affordable Care Act, but he lost the popular vote. And the bottom line is that he may be president, but he should what be President cognizant. Obama attempted to put through provisions of Obamacare without getting legislative approval. As a result, the things that the president, President Trump is doing now is completely legal because it didn't have the permanence of law. So if you want, let me finish. If you want to make it, if you want to, if you want to get something more permanent, it has to be part of a give and take. So this president president is is doing exactly what he criticized President Obama for doing, doing. which was signing executive orders. And And he has far outpaced any other president. And President Obama had to sign um, executive orders because he couldn't get it through the legislature. Because he Excuse wouldn't work me, with the sir. Republican Congress. Please let me finish. He wouldn't work with the Republican Please Congress. Please let me finish. No, the Republican Congress stonewalled everything that he did. Excuse me, do not interrupt. Mitch McConnell made a pledge the day he was sworn in that, that he would block everything that President Obama proposed. The night before he was in Therefore, field. sir, he had to go the executive order route. This president has a legislature that is 100, that, that is, no, it's, pl- excuse me, plurality Republican on in both chambers, and he can't get anything through. Let me point and out he to has you, to resort to, to executive order. To point out to both of you, the problems that we're having in Congress, and even with the president, you guys just gave a great example of what well, everything is so politicized that our electeds forget that they're elected to do the work of the people in a combined, unified way. And Absolutely. that's what we're not seeing. That's right. Okay, so and, to have this and the majority going on will not is cooperate with the minority. Okay, Thank so Thank goodness for the bureaucracy. Because the bureaucracy still, regardless of executive orders, can run the governments till the next election. Okay, now I'm, I want to switch a little bit because I want to get to how what's going on in the national level could affect us. And on the state level, Maya Rocky Moore Cummings, the wife of Congressman Elijah Cummings, entered the Dubin, gubernatorial Democratic primary race this week. Susan, wh- what do you think this has done to the race? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm delighted to see that there is a, a woman candidate just because, you know, we should hear from from all, all points of view. And a person of color. Um, yes, and she happens to be a, point, a person of color as well, although there already is um, one candidate, um, Rush Ern Baker. And Ben uh, Jealous. And, oh, I'm sorry, yes, and Ben Jealous. Um, uh, so um, I would say that um, Mrs. Cummings' addition to the race just makes it sort of more interesting. I think probably Rush Ern Baker, based on polls and things that I'm hearing, um, it, uh, county executive from Prince George's County, Rashern Baker, is ahead in the polls at this time. We have a long ways uh, to go, though. Absolutely. And also, you know, when it's a head-to-head race, I think, um, you know, Governor Hogan is still quite popular, although it's my understanding that his, his points have gone down, and it could be more of a race um, as we get closer to the general. Okay, now, the, Susan brought up a good point that, you know, Hogan is slipping a bit, and probably the Trump effect might be, you know, having some um, effect on his race. But Steve Bannon, Trump's former aide, this week announced that he is going to primary every Republican senator except Ted Cruz. (laughs) And day before yesterday, he announced that he plans on challenging Republican governors now who aren't helping Trump. So have you heard anything at all in Maryland, um, Lori, about what he might be doing, and and do you think that um, Hogan has any reason to be worried about the upcoming election? I don't think he has to be worried. It's very difficult to be a Republican uh, governor these days, or really, in fact, any Republican candidate has to walk a tightrope um, because of the climate that we're in. 
So I, I, uh, I don't, you mean I don't Maryland. Think in Maryland, yeah. and, well, really anywhere in the United States. So I, I think he does an excellent job of walking that tightrope. And when it's when it hurts Maryland, he says so about the health care. He mentioned that it hurt Maryland, um, and he's speaking for all of Maryland. As he rec he he represents all Marylanders too. Have you heard anything, so. Mark? If Bannon's got his well, little I, I fingers think, I think in that yet? The, in Maryland? You, you described it in the story, which is that this was sort of an off-the-cuff remark from, from Bannon that maybe he'll do governors too. Well, he's going to so do I, I, yeah. So I, I really, you know, until there's a little bit more evidence, I'm you not sure. Heard I would not take it all that seriously. Okay. Well, Sam, after all of this, is there anything to be happy about these days? There's a lot of things <laughs> to be happy about. We're alive. And if you're watching the show, you're alive. If you live in Montgomery County, you live in, have a great place to live. Your kids are getting a great education. We have all kinds of services. That's really terrific. And if you and in your retirement plan, folks, you got more money. I think that's really great. But the biggie is the really big thing to be happy about, especially if you're a political wonk, is we are going to have such a food fest for this upcoming election that we're just not going to know what to do. We're all going to gain 500 pounds <laughs> not feasting on this. We've got the local races. We've got the governor's races. What more can you ask for? I'm a happy camper. Uh, well, at, you're, I'm happy for you. Um, <laughs> stay tuned for Parting Shots. <laughs> Montgomery <laughs> County has lost a strong Republican fighter, and 21 this week has lost a colleague with the passing of Gene Rosser, who died from complications of leukemia. Jean was a community activist, a newspaper reporter, a wife and mother before she ran for office. She served in the House of Delegates from 1986 to 1994 when she defeated State Senator Larry Levitin, an Annapolis heavyweight. In 2002, she lost her seat at the same time that Congresswoman Connie Morello lost her seat. Jean was then appointed to be Secretary of Aging by Governor Ehrlich. Jean was a moderate and proud of it, and she reveled watching strong women attain political victories. She shall be missed. Rest in eternal peace, my dear, dear friend. Now, with parting shots, Sam. First, I want to pick up on what Susan was saying about Jean Rosser. She was a pleasure to work with in Annapolis on health care issues, on taxation issues, on just a whole bunch of things, and she was a moderate. And she was a politician who voted for things that were in the best interest of their constituents. My parting shot goes against Mr. Evans down at Metro. Why do you have to politicize the purple line and withholding funds? This is a, another great example of a politician not serving the public. Okay, Mark. Well, funny, I'm going to pick up on, on what Stan, we didn't coordinate on this, but uh, Governor Hogan, a number of days ago or weeks ago, called for a change in leadership at, uh, at Metro, the chairman. And uh, this week, uh, Jerry Conley, congressman from uh, Virginia, Democratic congressman and former chairman of the Fairfax uh, Board of Supervisors, so very knowledgeable about local issues, joined the governor in saying he should go. So I think that's something that we've got two jurisdictions to one now. More to come, I am confident. Lori. Um, I think Gene Rosser would want me to say this. Uh, I um, think we need a little more balance in our state, and I just wanted to mention that next weekend on October 20th, there is going to be a Maryland State Federation of Republican Women convention here in Montgomery County. And on Friday, uh, they're going to have a uh, leadership training institute, and if you're interested in being in a campaign, helping out, or running, please consider going. Go to their website, Maryland Federation of Republican Women. Okay. Susan, you're last. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to speak about um, the, a local race, and that's the uh, county executive race in Montgomery County. We have at least four, um, maybe five candidates, um, um, six, I guess, counting both parties. And there is a, um, and, and none of them are women, um, but there is a woman looking at the race, uh, former mayor of Rockville, Rose Krasnow. And I have it on good authority that she's very seriously looking at it and um, will be making her decision um, in late October or early November. And um, I think it's a, it's a race worth watching. So watch this space. 
this space is going to be interesting in the year ahead because I don't there isn't much going on on the Republican side but maybe if Steve Bannon has his way <laughs> he'll spice up a few things for us but on the Democratic side uh, the people just keep coming out of the woodwork and I think it will be interesting if there is a woman in the race for county executive on the Democratic side um, and I just think that the alphabet of where you are on the alphabet for your last name in a lot of races is going to be important. So if you're a guy out there running for office, change your name to Aaron Aardvark. I really <laughs> think the most important consideration is going to be the Washington Post endorsement. That's true. But Aaron Aardvark would be good on the county council at large race. Anyway, um, Jean will be laid to rest this weekend, and Jean and I had a very special bond in that we both voted for Hillary Clinton. So thank you for joining us, and be sure to follow us on social media. See you next time for Montgomery County's hardest-hitting political talk show, 21 This Week. I'm Susan Hilton. Bye for now.